So good evening to everyone. Uh, for those of you that I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is uh, Dennis Murray and I've had the uh, pleasure of uh, serving at Marist College in various capacities and mostly as president for the uh, last 40 years. And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 44th annual Efron Lecture in Jewish Studies. Uh, the Efron Lecture Series was established in 1976 by Bill and Sadie Efron to raise awareness of Jewish history, culture, and current affairs. Uh, Marilyn and I have had the pleasure of attending every one of these lectures during our 40 years here at Marist. It's always one of the highlights of the uh, academic calendar, and those of you who have participated in these events have experienced many wonderful lectures. Uh, the Efrons, as many of you know, of course, were civic and cultural leaders in Poughkeepsie and in Dutchess County, and also longtime friends of Marist College. Sadie Efron received her BA in English from Marist as an adult student in 1979, and uh, until her passing uh, in 2014, uh, she was our oldest living alumnae. Uh, the legacy of the Efron family um, certainly uh, lives on in their uh, uh, sons and uh, their grandsons and other family members, and several of them are with us uh, here tonight. So uh, let me begin by introducing Ira and Michael Efron, Bill and Sadie's sons. And I, I should note that both Sadie, Ira, and Dana Efron have all received the Marist College uh, President's Award for Community Service that we give uh, each year. Uh, Steve Efron uh, is also with us, uh, uh, Sadie and Bill's grandson, an active uh, community member and uh, currently member of the Marist Board of Trustees. So we're really grateful to uh, Steve for all the service that he uh, has given our college. Uh, let me also uh, recognize some special gifts, guests who are with us uh, this evening. Uh, first of all, Rabbi Rena Blumenthal, who coordinates Jewish uh, student activities at Marist and advises our Hillel Club. Uh, Byrne and Shirley Handel, community uh, leaders and great uh, supporters of Marist College. And I do want to recognize uh, tonight uh, Dr. Uh, Steve and Marianne Katz. And I want to point Steve out uh, because uh, he's director of the uh, medical director for Marist Physician Assistance uh, Program, which uh, just a couple months ago received the highest accreditation like a program like that can receive uh, in the United States. And uh, that program has had a remarkable record of our graduates uh, passing uh, the uh, boards that they have to take, almost a, a hundred percent. When we started this program in uh, 2016, uh, Steve was one of the uh, first people I called. I knew he was always an outstanding physician uh, in our community, but I also knew he'd be a great teacher if we could ever convince him to take on that role. So we were delighted that Steve uh, agreed to do that. And he's clearly one of the reasons that Maris Physician Assistance Program has been so successful and is quickly being recognized as one of the best uh, in the country today. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Josh Coatson. Uh, Josh, who many of you know, is an associate professor of English and is coordinator here at Marist College of our uh, Jewish Studies uh, program. He's an outstanding teacher, wonderful member of our community. I'm very grateful to him for helping us organize uh, this event. So uh, Josh will introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. I know we're in uh, uh, store for a great uh, program. We thank all of you uh, for being here with us. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Josh Coatson. Josh? Uh, thank you, President Murray. Uh, it's an honor for me to be a part of this ongoing tradition here at Marist for this, the 44th annual William and Sadie Efron Lecture in Jewish Studies. And thanks to the Efron family, who have been such a pleasure to get to know throughout the years. I'd also like to thank Julian Sharp and the digital technology team at Marist, without whom this event would not have been possible. This year, the Efron Lecture dovetails with the broader themes of Marist College's first year students common read program. 
which seeks to enlighten and unite the incoming class through their exploration of one common book. The common book uh, for this year's class, Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting by Joshua A. Douglas, um, deals with the uh, themes of citizenship, voting, and civic engagement, which are the themes as well of this lecture. And we hope that this lecture and the, the many other programs around this common read will educate our students and also help to motivate young citizens to participate robustly in our democracy. Finally, then, I'd like to introduce and extend my gratitude to our speaker tonight, David E. Lowe. Dr. Lowe's distinguished career includes the position from which he retired in 2016 as Vice President for Government Relations and Public Affairs at the Bipartisan National Endowment for Democracy. Prior to that, Dr. Lowe worked in the Civil Rights Division of the Anti-Defamation League. He's the holder of a PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins University, and he's also taught at multiple universities. Dr. Lowe's recent book, Touched with Fire, Morris B. Abram and the Battle Against Racial and Religious Discrimination, won the prestigious National Jewish Book Award for biography in 2019. Shortly, we will hear a great deal about Morris B. Abram, the subject of tonight's talk. Morris Abram, as we shall see, was an important figure in American history. His life and work encompassed many of the contentious issues we still face today, such as voting rights, affirmative action, and the enforcement of international human rights. Dr. Lowe has agreed to take questions tonight after the lecture, so please write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as the talk proceeds, and we'll have the chance for a brief moderated Q&A at the conclusion of the event. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David E. Lowe as he delivers his 44th annual William and Sadie Efron Lecture in Jewish Studies on the Actions and Passions of Morris B. Abram. Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Josh, for that kind introduction. I want to begin by thanking the Efron family for their sponsorship of this lecture series. President Murray and the Marist Community College of Community for inviting me to participate, and Professor Joshua Coatson for organizing the event. I am pleased to be joining you at a time when the college is incorporating the themes of civic engagement and democracy into its freshman curriculum. And I'm happy that you chose as your subject someone whose life embodied these critical values. In his celebrated Memorial Day address in Keene, New Hampshire, on the occasion of the 19th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, future Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. asked himself whether it was pressure from their local communities that convinced him and his fellow soldiers to engage in that bloody conflict, one that brought him close to death. His response was decidedly negative. I think, said Holmes, that as life is action and passion, it is required of a man that he should share the passionate action of his time at the peril of being judged not to have lived. Morris Berthold Abram, who was a strong admirer of, Dr. of Justice Holmes, questioned that observation when he appeared at a Senate confirmation hearing in 1983 on his nomination by President Reagan to be served on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. It was why he said he was willing to subject himself to tough questioning on the eve of his 65th birthday, a time when men and women his age were looking to retire. Abram certainly shared in the action and passion of his day. Born in 1918, he grew up in a small rural community in South Central Georgia at the height of Jim Crow segregation. From this humble origin, he became one of the country's leading civil rights lawyers. Bayard Rustin, the organizer of the 1963 March on Washington, sent a message to the Senate committee considering that nomination 20 years later. Morris Abrams' credentials in the struggle for civil rights need not be defended, Rustin wrote, for they are written with bold letters into American history. Those bold letters included service to five U.S. presidents from both political parties, chairmanship of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, first general counsel of the Peace Corps, 
co-chair of the White House Conference on Civil Rights, chairman of the Presidential Commission on Medical Ethics and Biomedical Research, convener of the historic 1987 Freedom Day rally on behalf of Soviet Jewry, and U.S. Ambassador to the European Office of the United Nations. His most significant accomplishment was achieved largely outside the public spotlight, namely a 14-year campaign of litigation, ultimately successful, to overturn his native Georgia's racially discriminatory electoral system. As his gravestone reads, Abram established for the first time in American jurisprudence the principle of one man, one vote. One could certainly argue that Abram's accomplishments are even more remarkable in light of his humble origins. Growing up in Fitzgerald, a small rural town in South Central Georgia, his immigrant father struggled to support his family with earnings from a dry goods store that failed to provide a secure income for his wife and their four children. Nevertheless, spending his childhood in one of 12 Jewish families in a small Southern town, instilled in Morris Abram a fierce determination to succeed. His background as an outsider, a Jewish Southerner living in a racially segregated community, played a major role in sensitizing him to the injustices he witnessed early in his life. Looking back on his life many years later, he reflected on the advantages his marginality had afforded him. If one is a Jew and lives in a small Southern town, he told an interviewer, one is bound to realize early that a minority group has a different position from a majority. By being one of such a small group, I was bound to get a certain insight that I would not have had as a member of the majority group. The town Abram grew up in was unique in American history. Fitzgerald, Georgia was the late 19th century product of one of the unlikeliest of marriages between an Indianapolis, Indiana newspaper editor and a deep Southern state governor from which emerged a refuge for near destitute pensioners who fought for the union in the Civil War. While planning the layout of the town, the Midwestern designers realized it would be unwise to alienate its Southern residents, many of whom had immigrated there to see history being made and for whom bitter memories of the war remain. Thus, on the east side of the town, the avenues were named for Grant, Sherman, and other Union generals. Avenues running north and south on the west side bore the names of Lee, Jackson, and other Confederate generals. Morris Abrams' parents were among the first to hold their wedding reception in the Lee Grant Hotel. His father, Sam Abram, was the third Jewish citizen in Fitzgerald, immigrating as a young man from his native Romania on the heels of the horrific Kishniev pogrom in 1903. His mother, Irene, was the daughter of one of the few doctors in town who had made his way south from her birthplace of Quincy, Illinois, Irene Cohen Abram was the granddaughter of a German-born rabbi of the reform movement, one of the first in the United States. And although there were a dozen Jewish families in the town, mainly of East European descent, she wanted little to do with them. Looking back over his childhood, Abram told an interviewer only half jokingly that he was raised as a Protestant. But he did have a Jewish neighbor of Dutch descent who introduced the studious young Abram to texts which illuminated the richness of Jewish history and culture that he read with great interest. And although he never had a bar mitzvah service in which to formally enter the ranks of Jewish adulthood, Abram, a talented public speaker from a very young age, would give his own sermons during his teenage years at Jewish life cycle events in his hometown and in surrounding communities. He also became interested in local and national politics. On the eve of Jimmy Carter's nomination for president in 1976, Abram wrote the following. Until the 1950s, most of the Southern population was rural. In those days, the courthouse proved most of the community's drama and entertainment. Chief attractions were the trials inside and nonstop discussion and argument over political affairs in the halls, on the steps, and spilling into a wide radius of the street. The heroes of my youth, and I belong to the same generation as Jimmy Carter, were not movie stars, sports figures, or the smart set, but politicians. An aware boy grew up with politics in his blood. Local issues unleashed passion, which burned like a brand. More remote topics dazzled youthful curiosity. Spurred by the obviously high regard of parents and community for the profession of politics, 
Techniques of debate and persuasive demeanor were studied and assimilated. Of all the stories Abram liked to tell about his childhood throughout his course of his life, his favorite was his father's account of an encounter between a visiting Ku Klux Klan leader from Indiana and the local sheriff, a close friend of Mars, Abram's father. When the Klansman offered the sheriff a membership card, the latter asked him what he stood for. Americanism came the reply. When asked to clarify, he responded with the use of epithets unsuitable for a poor public forum such as this one. And the sheriff threatened to run him out of town if he stepped out of line, which he did after discovering that the Klansman was wanted for crimes committed in another state. Abram took great pride in his father's friendship with the sheriff, whose campaign he had helped run behind the scenes. When Abram arrived at the University of Georgia in 1933, he was determined to nurture his interest in politics. Among his first stops was the building that housed Demosthenon, one of the country's first literary societies. The term literary society was actually a misnomer since its main activity was debating public issues. When Abram entered the building where the society was located and saw Herman Talmadge, son of the notoriously racist governor, he headed straight for Demosthenon's competitor, Phi Kappa, and soon became one of its leading lights. Shortly thereafter, he was declared the winner in a raucous debate with the younger Talmadge on the question of whether his father should be reelected. During Abram's junior year, at that point Phi Kappa's president, he dreamed up the idea of inviting President Franklin Roosevelt, who was spending time in Georgia receiving treatment for polio in a town called Warm Springs to become an honorary member of the society. Let me stop there and mention the coincidence that uh, Warm Springs was the location of a Biden speech uh, this morning in the presidential campaign. Abram made no attempt to hide the fact that he did so to put one over on his debate club's rival. He was delighted, if also a bit surprised, that the president not only accepted, but also invited Abram and his fellow officers to travel the 150 miles to Warm Springs to formalize his membership. What a marvelous thing for the country in me, said the young Morris Abram, that I, the son of an illiterate merchant, am now going to see the president of the United States. Later that year, Abram, who had long dreamed of studying in England, made the final cut for a Rhodes Scholarship before being eliminated. His roommate knew the reason. Morris, he said, if you want to succeed next year, you'll have to stop speaking like a hick. Abram got the message. And after receiving this high honor, prepared to set sail for Oxford in the fall of 1939. When the Rhodes program was suspended with the outbreak of World War II, Abram was able to complete a law degree and serve his country in the Air Force, where he received the Legion of Merit Award. With the Rhodes Scholarship program reinstated after the war, Abram, now married with a two-year-old daughter, set sail for England, and soon came under the tutelage of Oxford's Regents Professor, Professor of Jurisprudence, the American-born author Lehman Goodhart. After Goodhart returned from a visit to Nuremberg where the Allied powers were prosecuting Nazi war criminals, he suggested to the leading US prosecutor, Justice Robert Jackson, that he allow Abram to join his staff during his summer break. The experience proved life-changing for Abram. His assigned task was to comb the trial record of the top Nazi leadership to come up with evidence that could be used during the second wave of prosecutions against the industrialists who had fueled the Nazi war machine. In addition to hearing oral testimony, Abram watched graphic films, saw horrific photographs, and read documentation of the slaughter of the millions of Jews and others carried out by the Third Reich. It taught him unforgettable lessons that shaped many of his future views about international law, strengthened his belief in a homeland for the Jews, and brought him closer to the Jewish people. The experience at Nuremberg, he said, did as much as anything to establish his identity. When he returned to Atlanta after his Oxford scholarship, Abram joined a small firm whose senior partner, a highly respected leader in the Jewish community, gave the young lawyer the opportunity to litigate important cases. Abram was not reluctant to take on high profile ones and neither did he shy away from unpopular causes. 
He took on the Georgia medical establishment and leading insurance companies in a malpractice suit that resulted in the largest award yet given a patient in the history of DeKalb, the sizable suburban Atlanta County. At a time when Jim Crow segregation laws still ruled the South, Abram worked closely with the Atlanta Urban League to challenge, among many other indignities, the unfair allocation of bond funds for the erection of schools. As the League's local executive director, Grace Hamilton pointed out, he supported me in my efforts to, prove medi to improve medical facilities for blacks in the public hospital. He supported my successful efforts to bring black physicians on, on its staff. He fought to make land space available for blacks to live on. He worked for middle-class housing in which blacks could live. And of course, he was a leader in the fight to get rid of the county unit system, which was the pillar of racist politics. Hamilton would later become the first black woman to serve in the Georgia legislature. Beginning in 1917, statewide primary elections in Georgia were, were by law decided not by the popular vote, but rather by a system that was awarded unit votes to the winner of each county. Its intent was clear, namely to entrench rural interests at the expense of Georgia's urban population, particularly in Atlanta, and to a lesser extent in smaller cities such as my hometown of Savannah. That was because no matter how small the county, some with only, only a few thousand residents, it was entitled to two unit votes, while Atlanta's Fulton with over half a million residents then was entitled to only six. No wonder that Eugene Talmadge, who won the 1946 gubernatorial primary and eventually re-election while losing the popular vote, boasted that he never wanted to carry a county that had a streetcar. His son Herman described the system as the, only, as the state's only real bulwark against what he termed race mixing. That is because the system worked primarily to disenfranchise black voters who were intimidated from voting in rural counties and whose voting power was severely diminished in those few counties where they were not. In 1946, a progressive state legislator named Helen Douglas Mankin was elected to the United States Congress in a special election to replace the veteran Atlanta-based incumbent who was retiring. Because her election had not been a primary, but rather a special election, it had been based on the popular vote. And Mencken, who had a progressive record as a member of the state legislature, had won largely on the strength of the votes from the black precincts of Atlanta. The election struck fear in the hearts of the Talmadge political machine which saw what could happen should a popular vote system be employed to determine an election outcome. Under the county unit system, the local party's executive committee could decide whether to use the unit system or the popular vote in a congressional race. They moved at once to eliminate the popular vote option that had existed there for years in the fifth congressional district and bring back the unit system. They also recruited a state judge and former member of the Ku Klux Klan named James Davis to run against Mankin in the upcoming primary election. The strategy worked. Mankin was defeated despite once again attaining a popular vote majority. Backed by a small group of liberals, Mankin filed suit in federal court to declare the unit system of voting unconstitutional. The three judge federal panel ruled that since primaries were simply vehicles to nominate candidates for office, such as party conventions, the law was not unconstitutional. The problem with this analysis was that in Georgia, as in the rest of the South, the Republican party in those days barely existed. And everyone knew that the winner of the Democratic primary would become the winner of the general election. But there was another problem as well for Mankin and her fellow litigants. Just months before this ruling, in a case brought from Illinois, the Supreme Court ruled that so-called political issues were best settled not by courts, but by legislatures. In that case, in which the appellants had claimed that their voting power was diminished by unequal sized legislative districts, Justice Felix Frankfurter ruled that a court had no business getting bogged down in what he termed a political thicket. The federal court hearing Georgia's county unit case cited this case, Colgrove versus Green, in its opinion. When the case reached the Supreme Court, it dismissed the lawsuit as no longer timely and therefore moot. By the time Morris Abram moved back to Atlanta, Mankin had lost a second election to Davis and she was determined to continue her fight against the voting system, this time employing Abram as her attorney. 
Although the Supreme Court once again turned the case down, an interesting thing happened. Two justices, Douglas and Black, voted to hear it. Douglas used Abrams' argument that the voting strength of his clients, registered voters in Atlanta's Fulton County, was severely reduced by the voting system. Indeed, each vote outside that county would have at least 11 times the weight of each of their votes. Furthermore, the county unit system would weigh heavily upon the Black population since it was only in those areas where Blacks had voted in any significant numbers. Thus began Abrams' 14-year effort to fight this injustice. When his old college nemesis, Herman Talmadge, now Georgia's governor, tried to incorporate the county unit system into the state constitution, Abrams chaired a citizens group in Atlanta that led the opposition, which turned back the effort by winning successive victories in 1950 and 1952 by popular vote majorities. Abram found other ways as well to fight his state's voting system. He wrote opinion pieces and scholarly law review articles pointing out its inequities. He even ran for Congress in 1954 to unseat James Davis following Davis's 1952 victory in which he lost the popular vote to a progressive lawyer. Abram would later describe his campaign against the former Klansman as one of the nastiest in history. Shortly after he announced his candidacy, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education that the system of separate but equal schooling in the South was unconstitutional. Abrams' opponent attacked his position that the law of the land must be upheld. He drew attention to Abrams' membership in the American Civil Liberties Union, which he claimed was giving clandestine aid to the Communist Party, and he berated Abram as the candidate of Blacks and the most radical elements of organized labor. After losing the election by getting defeated in the two smaller counties of the three in the congressional district, Abram returned to his battle against the unit system by taking on a new client, Atlanta's Mayor William Hartsfield. Mayor Hartsfield, whose forward-looking views helped make Atlanta the city too busy to hate, knew that its citizens could have no meaningful role in Georgia's governance as long as the unit system dominated the state's politics. Arguing that the upcoming primary election in 1958 would dilute his vote and the votes of his constituents, he and his lawyer sought an injunction to enjoin the state's Democratic Party from holding it under the unit vote. They were acting under the terms of the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1957, which gave federal courts the ability to offer injunction relief in voting rights cases. When the local judge refused to honor their request, even to convene a federal panel to hear the case, Abram took the unusual step of petitioning the U.S. Supreme Court to force him to do so. This led his wife, Jane, to ask, Morris, can't you beat the county unit system without suing a federal judge? Although the Supreme Court turned down the petition, Abram was again encouraged, this time not only by the dissents of Justices Douglas and Black, but also the fact that they were now joined by Eisenhower appointees Earl Warren and William Brennan. He trusted that it would not be long before a breakthrough would come. It did come four years later in a landmark case of Baker versus Carr, a reapportionment case that reached the high court from the state of Tennessee. Overruling the court's 1946 decision not to hear cases involving unequal legislative districts, it cited Morris Abrams and Mayor Hartsfield's attempt to overturn Georgia's unit system four years earlier. Having heard about the Baker decision from a reporter friend, a jubilant mayor called Abram with the news, confident that overturning the state's electoral system will be, quote, the biggest thing to hit Georgia since General Sherman's march to the sea. Let me stop here to tell a, an interesting insider story about this. Um, mayor Hartsfield's name never appeared on the, uh, in the case, uh, even though Abram said he was ready to go with the case and that Mayor Hartsfield's name was on it. What happened was that Mayor Hartsfield said to his uh, friend, Morris Abram, Morris, uh, you're gonna have to give me a day on that because I'm going to have to check with the cigar. Who was the cigar? Um, if you go to Emory University these days, you see the name Woodruff on a lot of the campus buildings. And in fact, when I was doing research for the book, I spent a lot of time in the Woodruff Library because Morris Abrams' papers are archived there. And the Woodruff Library has a statue of a, of a short guy holding a cigar. 
Well, he was none other than Robert Woodruff, the man who turned Coca-Cola into the great international sensation that it still is today. And he was Mayor Hartsfield's most uh, important donor and his uh, close conf confidant. And uh, the next day, Hartsfield called Abram and said, Morris, you're going to have to get some other name put on this, uh, on this petition. Because obviously, um, Woodruff was worried. It was a very, very powerful um, lobby that was lobbying against, uh, against uh, the county unit system. And there would have been clear implications for his business. At least he was worried that that would happen. On April 29th, 1962, the federal courtroom in Atlanta's old post office building was packed to the rafters and filled with anticipation. As U.S. Circuit Court Judge Griffin Bell, a future Attorney General of the United States, began to read in his slow Southwest Georgia drawl his panel's decision in the case of Sanders versus Gray. Halfway through his slow reading of the 17-page decision, it became clear to Abram and his colleagues from his law firm that they were on the verge of their first victory over the county unit system in 13 years. Mayor Hartsfield turned to his friend and winked. When Judge Bell finished reading the unanimous decision, the mayor jumped in the air. Abram's daughter, Anne, walked to the front and gave her father a hug. Victory celebrations followed. But Morris Abram still had one more battle to fight. Although Judge Bell's opinion had overturned the unit system on grounds that it was discriminatory as then constituted, it left open the possibility that a different arrangement of unit votes might be acceptable. And Abram's ultimate objective was to eliminate any vestige of a system that violated the principle of one man, one vote. The federal court's decision in Sanders versus Gray was watched closely by a peanut farmer from the rural southwestern part of the state. Jimmy Carter, who considered the outcome of the county unit case one of the most momentous judicial decisions of the century in Georgia, soon announced his candidacy for one of the new state Senate seats created as a result of the decision. Emerging victorious, he now represented a district located less than 90 miles from the small town where Morris Abram grew up. Following the ruling by Judge Bell and his colleagues, the chairman and secretary of the Georgia State Democratic Executive Committee and the Secretary of State of Georgia took their defense of the county unit system to the United States Supreme Court, which for the first time in the long battle against it, agreed to accept the case. The oral argument was set for January 17, 1963, even before any of the numerous legislative reapportionment cases from around the country that had joined the high court's lineup after Baker versus Carr legitimated their hearing. The month before the January date, Abram received a confidential message from U.S. Solicitor General Archibald Cox with the startling news that Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy had decided to argue the U.S. government's position in the case. The practice of having the Attorney General choose one case to argue during his tenure in office was not unprecedented, but what made this development so unusual was that Bobby Kennedy had never argued a case. Indeed, he had never even entered a courtroom. In fact, it was no accident that the Attorney General was arguing the government's position. Archibald Cox had been a student of Felix Frankfurter at Harvard Law School, and like his mentor, was skeptical about the court's intervention in cases that were deemed to be of a political nature. The government was taking the same position as the circuit court, which was that Georgia's unit system was only unconstitutional as it was then in effect, but not per se unconstitutional, which was the position of Abram and his client, Atlanta businessman James O'Hare Sanders. And remember, Sanders was the one who had replaced Mayor Hartsfield. When Abram met with Cox and the Attorney General on the day before oral argument, he pressed his position about the impossibility of advising a unit system that didn't violate the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection of law. When Bobby Kennedy said that he agreed with that position, Cox reminded him that the government had, had filed its brief and his job would be to adhere to that position. It was clear to Supreme Court observers on the morning of January 17, 1963, that this day in court would be different, if not historic. The courtroom audience included members of the Kennedy family, including the Attorney General's mother, Rose, 
his wife Ethel, his sister-in-law, the First Lady Jacqueline, and his brother, the young freshman Senator Edward Kennedy, who was being sworn in that day to the Supreme Court bar. After the two attorneys in the state of Georgia's Attorney General's office made their arguments, Abram took the floor. He had looked forward to this day for 14 years when he had first been approached by former Congresswoman, Congresswoman Helen Mankin to take her case. Pressed by Justice Potter Stewart on whether age, literacy, and other requirements are not legitimate for governments to insist upon, Abram agreed that they are. Though, he said, once they are established, you can't make distinctions among voters simply on the basis of where they live. The lawyers for the state told the court that the legislature had improved the county unit system, but Abram countered with the fact that the lower court, the lower house that had approved the law represented a mere 22% of the people and the state Senate a mere 5.5%. He pointed out that when the voters had an opportunity to vote on the Talmadge amendments to the state constitution, they had rejected the unit system by comfortable popular majorities. When asked by Justice Brennan whether the court should rule this system per se unconstitutional, Abram said he was arguing for doing precisely that, because if the court writes an opinion, it would need to set guidelines on how the Constitution should be interpreted. He closed by adding, I do not think there is any way that you can uphold this system until you can say that two equals four or feel that 50 cents is the proper amount of change for a dollar or that you can give eight ounces per pound. I think a qualified voter is a qualified voter is a qualified voter and a vote is a vote is a vote. By an overwhelming eight to one vote, the court agreed. Two months later, it's, it published its ruling, fittingly written by Justice William Douglas, who had descended from the court's earlier decisions not to hear the county unit cases. His words vindicated Morris Abrams' longtime quest for voter equality. Quote, the conception of political equality from the Declaration of Independence to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to the 15th, 17th, and 19th Amendments can mean only one thing, <clears throat> one person, one vote. For so many people, an accomplishment like this would be the end of the story. Not so for Morris Abram, not by a long shot. Shortly before his argument before the Supreme Court, Abram made the difficult decision to move his family to New York, where he accepted a partnership in one of the leadies, country's leading law firms, Paul, Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. The history of this decision to move to New York is quite interesting. Remember that I said Abram had grown up in a rural Southern town with 12 Jewish families. When he attended the University of Georgia, he chose not to join a Jewish fraternity and considered himself an anti-Zionist. But over time, his attachment to the Jewish people grew, beginning with his year spent at the University of Chicago, where he completed his law degree when the Rhodes Scholarship Program was suspended. There he befriended the Reconstructionist rabbi who headed the campus Hillel program, and under his influence began thinking of Judaism as a people and not simply a religion. That view was reinforced by his experience at Nuremberg several years later. I would never be the same after Nuremberg, he wrote, for I now understood that the veneer of civilization is thin and that when it cracks, even in the 20th century, the Jew is a first victim. When he returned to Atlanta after the end of his two years at Oxford, Abram began consulting for the two national Jewish defense organizations, the American Jewish Committee and the Anti-Defamation League. His work for the latter included authoring a pamphlet on countering the Ku Klux Klan, which led to legislation in five Southern states prohibiting the wearing of masks during that group's hate-filled rallies. His growing involvement in the American Jewish Committee played a major role in Abrams' decision to move the family to New York, where he believed he could become involved in its national work. During the same year in which he achieved his final victory over Georgia's county unit system with the Supreme Court's one person, one vote ruling, Morris Abram became, at age 45, the youngest president in the history of the American Jewish Committee. It was not long before he led an AJC delegation to the Vatican where he played a leading role in convincing Pope Paul VI to issue the church's historic proclamation against anti-Semitism. Three years later, 
this one-time anti-Zionist, led the rally on behalf of the state of Israel across the street from the White House during the Six-Day War. As his involvement in the Jewish community grew, Abram recalled, I found the essence of what it meant to me to be Jewish. That essence lies in the collective unconscious of the people from whom I sprang, the linkage of ourselves one to another, the ties that we all feel to a greater or lesser extent to Zion, and the determination to survive as Jews, free men and women, wherever we may live. At this point, you may be asking yourself, did Morris Abram, a man whose life was filled with accomplishment, ever experience failure and disappointment? In the early 1960s, Abram told an official of the American Jewish Committee that his dream job was to be a university president, and if afforded the choice, it would be Brandeis, the only non-sectarian institution of higher learning in the US sponsored by the American Jewish Committee. That dream came true when he was selected from 120 applicants to become Brandeis's second president, succeeding its founder, Abram Sacker. I won't go into detail here, but we can discuss it further if you like during the uh, question period. But suffice it to say that the year and a half following his celebratory inaugural weekend in the fall of 1968, I might add that was my freshman year as well, was the most agonizing of his life. Some of you will recall that the year 1968 was one of the most divisive in this country since the Civil War. Few university presidents were spared from having to deal with the turmoil that beset elite universities such as Brandeis. Coping with the aftermath of an 11 day occupation of a university building took its toll on Abram and ultimately led to his resignation as president. But it also, he said, toughened him for the second major challenge of his life, which came only three years after he resigned from Brandeis. That was his contraction of an acute form of leukemia that most of his closest associates did not expect him to survive. Many of his friends, family, and associates believed that it was his sheer determination to overcome this hideous disease that led his doctors to declare him cancer-free six years later. During the period of his illness, Abram continued to litigate complicated cases and led the successful investigation of New York's nursing home industry on behalf of Governor Carey. Within a decade, he would be fighting another battle, this time with a new generation of civil rights leaders, many of whom had discarded the concept of a colorblind interpretation of the law to one that sanctioned racial preference and group rights. Like his good friend, Martin Luther King, Abram was dedicated to the idea that individuals should not be judged by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character and the quality of their ideas. He argued that categorizing people by their race was the very antithesis of what the authors of the 1964 Civil Rights Act had envisioned. And he warned of the dangers of using race and ethnicity as political tools in a pluralistic society. The state must not tag and assign rights on the basis of race, sex, or religion, he wrote. If we do, we shall surely end up at each other's throats. Following Abram's successful victory over leukemia, he went on to a second career of accomplishments, among them leading the Freedom Day rally on the National Mall on behalf of Soviet Jewry, which he described as the largest gathering in Jewish history since Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Serving as President George H.W. Bush's ambassador to the European Office of the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, which houses the UN's major agencies, such as the World Health Organization and the Human Rights Council, and founding UN Watch, a non-governmental organization based in Geneva, which calls out that international institution's relentless bullying of Israel and its repeated failure to condemn authoritarian regimes that deprive their citizens of basic human rights. At Abrams' funeral on Cape Cod in March 2000, the young executive director of UN Watch spoke of his mentor's youthfulness, his vigor, his devotion to ideas, his incomparable warmth and charisma. His daughter Anne noted her father's relentless desire to connect with people and his insatiable intellectual curiosity. His son Joshua echoed that sentiment, saying he woke up every morning wondering, what can I learn today? 
Today, our country is as polarized as we have been in any year since 1968. I believe if Morris Abram were asked today how we should move forward, this man who lived a life of action and passion would say that we need to go back to first principles, a return to civil public discourse, a vigorous defense of free speech, and a reverence for the rule of law, which he regarded as the foundation on which a diverse country such as ours depends. As he said in his inaugural address at Brandeis, we must rely upon the methodology of fair play, civil liberty, and due process as the only way in which a civilized society can pursue truth, prevent the incrustation of error, and ensure the fulfillment of our creative talents and inclinations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. That was wonderful. <clears throat> um, so again, we have, we have a couple questions already. And if people have questions um, that they'd like to that they'd like me to ask Dr. Lowe, they can type them in the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen. That was wonderful. Um, the first question that we have is fairly specific, um, and it's uh, what was Bobby Kennedy's role in the Sanders argument? So that goes specifically to the Supreme Court. Right, um, right. It's a good question. I hope I, wa I wasn't uh, getting too much into detail that it confused you. Uh, no, no. If I did, it, it, uh, it's, it's understandable. Um, his position was a third position between the two positions. He was arguing essentially the government's case. In the Supreme Court, the government very often uh, enters a case uh, in which it's not a major party, uh, and it's given a set amount of time by the, by the court. Um, it's usually argued by the Solicitor General, but as I, as I pointed out, Archibald Cox was very ambivalent about arguing that case. And um, so um, uh, a lot of his, uh, his aides who favored the, uh, actually favored the Abram position, <laughs> um, encouraged um, the Attorney General to get involved in the case. So he was arguing a position to basically uphold the circuit court's decision, which said essentially that um, the county unit system as it now exists is unconstitutional, which was in a sense giving the, the Georgia state legislature uh, a green light to go back and try to figure out a better way to do it. But what Abram wanted to argue was to say, look, let's get real. This system is unconstitutional any way you can possibly devise it. And that was the position that won eight out of nine Supreme Court um, votes. Um. Uh, the next question is, is a more, uh, I guess, um, speculative question about the present, um, and it's the following. Do you think that uh, Abram's notion of colorblindness requires re-examination in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement? Now the consensus among social justice activists is that colorblindness is a problem, not a solution. So I wonder what you think about that. Well, it's a, it's a very good, thoughtful question, um, a complicated question. Um, he was an idealist and um, he was very close to Martin Luther King. I did not, uh, because the time was limited, I did not talk about his close relationship with Martin Luther King. He played a major role in getting King um, uh, out of prison right before the 1960 presidential election. And in fact, encouraged King's father to endorse um, Kennedy, which uh, made a difference. Uh, it was a very close election, made a difference. It, it's, well, it's thought it made a big difference among black voters in the North. And Martin Luther King's position, and um, you know, for those who think that we, um, that, that, that a colorblind society is a very radical idea, that was the dream of Martin Luther King. And uh, yes, it's being challenged today, no question about that. Um, and I would encourage you to read the book and uh, get into um, you know, some of Abram's arguments. It was, uh, I'd spend a chapter, at least a chapter, talking about how he dealt with this issue. And as I said, he lost a lot of friends in the movement. The civil rights movement was turning against the colorblindness and more toward um, you know, government, um, you know, using race as a category, which um, Abram uh, believed was unconstitutional. One thing I might add is um, uh, one, one issue that's not received a lot of attention and all, and you can understand it with all the hoopla over the, over the current election campaign, 
Uh, and something to watch on election night uh, is uh, a, um, a um, referendum in the state of California on the question of racial preference. Um, uh, California voted uh, to, um, to put colorblindness into its state constitution and, and in college admissions, it does not use that. Um, and yet the diversity has gone up in the state system. And uh, so that's something very, uh, so they're trying to overturn that uh, referendum. And I think that's something that needs, that, that should be watched very carefully. California is a very, very um, progressive state. And I might add the state of Washington, another progressive state has turned down various opportunities to um, put racial preference into its law, into its state constitution and has turned it down. Um, the next question is also more oriented towards the present, and, and I'm sure it's an interesting question. What do you think Abram would have thought about the state of the current Supreme Court? I thought you were <laughs> going to ask me about the Electoral College. Um, no. <laughs> well, uh, um, the state of the Supreme Court, uh, well, that's a broad question. Um, do you mean the composition of the court? I, um, I guess. I, I, I don't know. I think um, it's probably in regard to the, the Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, um, that's a tough one. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm asked um, if I had, if Morris Abram were to come back, he died in the year 2000, what question would I ask him? That would be on my list. <laughs> uh, I, I would fear to speculate. He did become more conservative as he, as he, um, uh, got up in the in age, and uh, he would he argued that um, you know the country moved to the left on these issues, and that he was maintaining his position. Um, uh, but um, he also, uh, I think you could argue that he did, and certainly um, you again read the book. I have a chapter called Transition, and it gets into this question. He had become. Uh, supportive of Jimmy Carter's presidency, uh, but then he ended up voting for Reagan in 1980. And uh, I won't get into that because um, if I do, maybe you won't buy the book. Um, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your, uh, your thinking about sort of the, the big picture of Abram's life that He's, he had such a, um, a kind of eventful life in reaction to so many of the major movements of American politics and history of the whole 20th century between all the, the, the stories you talked about. And I wonder if you, th how you're, you kind of understand that, um, that set of experiences. Do you think it had to do with something about Abram himself, or do you think there was a sort of a, a, a lucky quality almost, a sort of Zelig-like lucky quality where he just kind of kept finding himself in these incredibly formative um, moments? Well, it gets to the whole question of action and passion. Um, you know, he, that, that, that quotation that um, it goes back to the early part of the uh, talk where he said, uh, you know, he, he, when you grow up in a mar where, where he, he was an outsider all his life, but he said he, that was an advantage. In fact, his daughter, Ruth, um, whom I didn't mention in the lecture, he had five children, by the way, all of them alive and very successful. His daughter, Ruth, who's the founder of the um, Lower East Side Tenement Museum in, in Lower Manhattan, um, told me that, um, you know, his, his position as an outsider, he emphasized to his children, was a, was a good position to be in, not a bad position to be in. And he said his marginality gave him that fire, that passion um, to succeed. He was very, very ambitious. Um, as one of his um, law partners um, told me, a man who's now in, in his 90s, he said um, he had... Uh, a greener grass, uh, what is it, uh, a, gra a green grass complex. <laughs> Things were always greener. Uh, and he said he climbed and climbed and climbed. And um, 
And yet he always wanted to give credit to uh, all of his partners. He got most of the credit, of course, for the county unit uh, case. Um, but he, um, whenever he was interviewed, he always was very careful to say uh, that this was a team effort. And um, so, you know, he, he, he was a very, very ambitious guy. Interesting. There, there are two questions now about the Electoral College, <laughs> about whether you believe it's constitutional and whether you, th you think it should be eliminated. And I guess I would, I would add also whether you think um, Morris Abram thought it was constitutional and whether he might have thought it should be eliminated. Well, I actually have an answer to the second question, which will probably surprise everybody. Uh, let me go back to um, uh, Gray versus Sanders. Mm -hmm. Justice Potter Stewart um, asked Bobby Kennedy point blank, "What about the Electoral College? Isn't this well? Let me let me go back further. The, one of the things that the Georgia attorneys general were arguing was that this is just like the Electoral College. You know, we have county unit votes, and you have um, electoral college votes." And yet, <laughs> uh, Abrams' position was, and um, the court's position was, that uh, it was nothing of the sort. It was, a, it was a, the, the counties were just conveniences. They were administrative units. They were not sovereign uh, bodies, so like states that can pass laws and raise taxes and do things like that. Um, and so uh, during the, during the uh, argument, Potter Stewart asked Bobby Kennedy, what about the Electoral College? And Kennedy made a defense of the Electoral College. He was obviously ready, if he'd been brief, he was ready for that. He said that the Electoral College was a compromise. Um, it can't be, it's not unconstitutional, it's, it's in the constitution. And it was a compromise between the larger states and the smaller states. And it was one of those compromises that was made in order to get the constitution accepted and ratified in the absence of which might not have been. And interestingly enough, when, when Morris Abram appeared on William Buckley's firing line in 1982, um, he, the only line I found in any of my research where Abram addressed this question was that Abram said that the 14th amendment was devised to protect people, not states. And uh, so you could say, well, maybe by then he'd become conservative, neoconservative, whatever. Uh, but that was what he said. And that was Bobby Kennedy's position back in 1963. Um, my own position is a little more complicated, um, but you didn't come here to hear me talk about me. You came here to talk about, I came here to talk about Mars Um, Very interesting. I wonder, actually, if you can talk, one of the things I found fascinating um, about uh, the lecture and about uh, the life that you described, that you described is the way that uh, he changed over time in relation to his sense of his Jewish identity, identity and Zionism. Um, and I'm interested if you can talk a little bit more about that and what you think yeah whether you think those were external factors that pushed him in certain directions or whether it was something internal or just how you kind of think about that transformation. It's really one of the most interesting aspects of the book. Um, and uh, I was only able to cover it, uh, you know, in a, in a sketchy kind of way, but yes, um, he grew up in his in his house. His his mother, who was the dominant force in his family, felt that uh, Judaism. And remember, her grandfather was a rabbi, reform rabbi. Uh, and his her feeling was that Judaism is a, is a religion. And as Morris Abram told an interviewer, um, because there was no church in my town, um, you know, there was no religion for me. Uh, meaning no no synagogue. Now the, the the other twelve families and the other ten or eleven families in town did meet as a congregation in the Mason Lodge, and they and and in 1941 uh, or two after Abram had left, long left Fitzgerald, 
um, they built a synagogue. They're very proud of it. I visited it in, in Fitzgerald doing research for the book. Um, but it was interesting. He, he became very interested at a very early age in the culture, in Jewish history, in Jewish culture. And as I said, he gave speeches. <laughs> he gave speeches. He didn't have his own bar mitzvah ceremony, but he gave speeches at other bar mitzvah ceremonies at, at around the same age, which is really quite remarkable. He didn't want to be in a Jewish fraternity in, 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 uh, when he went off to the University of Georgia. Um, he said that violated his sense of you know, universalism. He did uh, travel with, a, um, with two colleagues um, for a YMCA program, um, talking about you know, how religion should uh, interact and work with each other and so forth. He said it was very superficial looking back over it. But then um, when he went to law school at Chicago, um, as I said, he came under the influence of uh, Rabbi Proskauer, I believe, um, who, um, uh, who, be, who, who, it was the first time he confronted Judaism in a serious way and um, was challenged in his own beliefs. And then Nuremberg happened and that was really the big turning point for him. Um, he went back to Atlanta and I said he got involved with these uh, Jewish defense organizations, but it was, it was almost um, by chance. He, he, he started consulting for ADL and AJC and teaching Sunday school at the Temple of Atlanta. Now that's the famous synagogue that was bombed by white supremacists in 1958, um, mostly because he needed the money. Um, and uh, it's funny, <laughs> you get involved in things. Uh, but of course, you know, someone with a, with a mind of his quality, you know, uh, was not going to just be on the sidelines. And like I said, he authored that pamphlet uh, on the Klan, uh, which actually was a very, very important uh, piece of literature. And as I said, it led to the unmasking of the Ku Klux Klan in five southern states. That legislation still on the books. Um, it went to court in the 90s, by the way. You know, there's question of masking has, has become now more now relevant in the light of some of these protests, these Antifa protests. Um, and the courts may, may have to look at them again. And a similar case was brought by the Klan in Georgia and it was upheld in the 90s. Um, so anyway, he got very involved in those organizations and then became, in, 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 and became a leader in these organizations at the national level. Um, and in the 1980s, he was called back to become the chairman of something called the National Conference on Soviet Jewry. Um, this was after Brandeis, after leukemia, after, um, you know, all these uh, things that had happened to him in the course of his life, after the nursing home investigation um, under Governor Kerry, and um, got deeply involved in the Soviet Jewry movement, very deeply involved. And uh, that led to him becoming chairman of the Conference of Presidents. Um, and he became really one of the most eloquent and ardent defenders of the state of Israel. And um, if any of your uh, listeners here in the audience um, would like to know more about UN Watch, I hope some of you already know about UN Watch. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful organization. And uh, he was the founding chairman, became very involved in that. And uh, unwatch.org, go to their website. Um, they have a big event coming up, uh, I think next week. Um, and so, um, uh, he was, <laughs> by the time of his death, he was, um, one of his, uh, one of the people I interviewed, um, who had been a foe of Morris Abram in several pieces of litigation. Uh, his name would be very familiar to people in this audience. Uh, um, I called him super Jew. <laughs> And uh, he didn't mean it in a flattering way, but uh, that's, that's, that was the reputation he ended up having. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, we are pretty much at the end of our allotted time. Um, you've been very generous with, with your time, with your answers. And, it's been a pleasure and, to be here. And just wonderful, um, wonderful to have you at our virtual Marist. Um, and thank you to all of all of the audience and, and our guests. Um, and uh, hopefully next year we'll all see each other in person. We can do this in person. Um, 
So I just wanted to thank everyone and, and wish everyone a, a good evening. And I think we are going to conclude our event for now. So thank you so much to everyone. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lowe. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night.